Snapshot isolation and read committed snapshot isolation provide a way to solve all of these problems by being more optimistic about how locking works in SQL Server. Now they aren't fully optimistic, but they are very optimistic. And let's talk about what that means. Read committed snapshot provides a new isolation level for your database. If you enable read committed snapshot on the database, it's a database property. You can also change it on the model database to change the default for new databases on your instance. If you enable read committed snapshot isolation in a database, what you're saying is I am changing the default isolation level from read committed to read committed snapshot so that folks who connect and they don't say anything about their isolation level, they're just like, hey, I wanna run a query they will use read committed snapshot automatically with node code changes. They don't have to say tr set transaction isolation level, read committed snapshot isolation. Nope, this is the default isolation level for the database and it kicks in right away. Now it will still honor <laughs> things like no lock hints. If your code, if you've had blocking problems and your code is just riddled with no lock hints already and you change the default isolation level for your database, well, those hints in your code, they're still gonna be honored. <laughs> so it changes the default isolation level. It does not override all the uh, isolation level hints that you necessarily have in your code. Snapshot isolation is a, not a default isolation level at all. Snapshot isolation, what you do on a database is you change a setting that says, I'm going to allow snapshot isolation. That means that people can start saying set transaction isolation level snapshot. You can enable snapshot without enabling RCSI and vice versa, you can also enable both. And the nice thing about snapshot isolation is that if you allow snapshot isolation, well, there's really two nice things about snapshot isolation. So the first nice thing about snapshot isolation is that it doesn't change the default isolation level for the database. That actually can be a nice thing for an existing workload where you're like, I actually, I don't want everything to change its behavior yet because we have to be very careful about how our transactions interact. So the fact that snapshot isolation doesn't change the default isolation level for your database and it just lets individual sessions say, I wanna use snapshot isolation, that is actually a good thing because it limits your surface area of where things can get weird. And we'll talk a little more about how things can get weird. The other nice thing about snapshot isolation is that it provides pr protection for your queries at the transaction level instead of the statement level. This can be useful. Let's say I have a report and my report has four different queries that run in a sequence. And the queries are looking at, let's say, the last three quarters of data. There's three queries that look at recent quarters of data. And then the fourth query looks at all three of them together and sums them up. But they run as separate queries in sequence. I want all of these queries to return data that is consistent with one another. I, if, if changes are still coming in, for the current quarter and that's involved somehow, or if we're still finishing up last quarter and the data is changing, I want the numbers to add up. I don't want different data appearing in different queries. Snapshot isolation helps you with this because under snapshot isolation, if you say begin tran and then you start running queries, the data you see in the entire transaction is gonna be consistent with the first time you access data during that transaction. So if, I mean, to make it really extreme, if on Monday morning, I set my transaction isolation level to snapshot and I do begin tran and I run a query, I'm gonna get data consistent with Monday morning. That's all good, right? But if I don't close the transaction and if my session stays connected, maybe I forget. And it's Tuesday morning and I come in and I go into that same session with the open transaction and I run another query, I'm gonna get data consistent with Monday morning. I'm not gonna get any data for Tuesday. And SQL Server will have had to maintain versions for data for the entire time because it doesn't know when I'm gonna come back and query something else next, right? So with snapshot isolation comes great power. I can run multiple different statements and get data consistent with the first time I access data, but with great power, there is great responsibility.
because if lots of things have been changing on my instance and I'm leaving these transactions open for very long periods of time, I have a lot of versions that have built up because these optimistic alternatives, they don't rely on that pessimistic, pessimistic locking. They do still use some locking. Things like, hey, I'm querying this table, please don't drop it. <laughs> but they use versions instead of locks to make sure their reads of consistent. Instead of being pessimistic and it being all about protecting ourselves, it is optimistic. When modifications happen, we're gonna use timestamps and versioning information so that, hey, if a read comes in, they will get consistent data, even if my modification is transaction, doing a modification, even if it's still going on and it's off doing something else. That is what optimistic is all about. And the benefits of optimistic locking are great. Under these pessimistic forms of read committed and above, readers block writers and writers block readers. If I'm reading data, I'm protecting it with a lock. You've got to wait. Under optimistic locking, readers don't block writers and writers don't block readers. SQL Server is able to very cleverly use timestamps and the version store to make magic happen behind the scenes to reduce blocking. Now writers still block writers. <laughs> That hasn't changed. Under uh, read committed snapshot and snapshot isolation, writers still block writers, but readers don't block writers and writers don't block readers. So let's take a look at an example of how this works. We've got an index on first name and we're zooming in on a page that is pictured on the left side of the index here. If we zoom in on that page at the left side of the index, in reality, it would have more names on it, but we're just picturing a few relevant names here. We've got these rows on the page and an update starts. The update is gonna change this name so that instead of A-A-B-A-N, it's Z-Z-A-A-B-A-N. So it's moving it to the page that's on the far right of the index. If we've enabled snapshot isolation, when this happens, the row still moves. That's still the same, but SQL Server will use 14 bytes of information to store information about, hey, when did this change happen? What, what is the unique identity for this change? But it's able to encapsulate it in only 14 bytes. This is really, really powerful for SQL Server in combination with something called the version store. The version store is in TempDB and the before version of our row our row here is just pictured as one column. The before version of our row before the change heads on over to the version store. And that means that if we need to access that data that has been updated, we have information on when that happened and what the data was before the update. That can be incredibly powerful. Of course, there is overhead here. We've got our row version in the version store. We have to take the effort of putting it in there, maintaining it, and eventually cleaning it up when it's safe. We also are using extra space in our index to indicate, hey, 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 this data has changed. So this isn't totally free, but it is very, very powerful. A read, now if I'm counting the names again, I've started my read. I've already counted the rows in the A of the index. So now my read says, oh, okay, I'm moving along, I'm in the middle of the index. The read still has no idea at this point that an update has happened, but behind the scenes, another session just came in and it updated that row. That was a little instant replay there. <laughs> so that row updated while I'm in the middle of the table. Now this bird has a lock in its mouth, but in this case, our read isn't using pessimism to lock those rows. That lock should probably be kind of transparent. There is still some locking going on here. Like I said, we've got to do schema stability locks, right? But we aren't locking the page as we go. So now I'm in the middle of the row, the, the, I'm in the middle of the index. The row has been updated. When I get to the end of the index, I see the updated row that's there now, that's Z-Z-Z-A-B-A-N, but that 14 bytes is there. And that 14 bytes can very quickly identify, hey, the time at which this update happened to put this row here, it's, it's after when you started your read. 
You started, we know that I started my read at a given time. And this time info says, uh, 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 no, this is new stuff. I don't have to, to consider this column that's here for this row because of the information on the row. I can simply disregard it. I do not have to double count it. Similarly, if the update happens the other way, I don't undercount as well. I'm scanning through this index and I'm in the middle when another session comes in and starts an update and it moves the row that's ZZABAN to the A's. So now the row that's ZZABAN that I before didn't count, when I get to the point where the row for ZZABAN is, I see that there's, hey, this row has been modified since you started your transaction. Yeah, the update has completed, but I need to get data consistent with the time that I started under RCSI, the time I started my statement, or under snapshot, the time I started my entire explicit transaction, if I have one. I need to see data consistent with that time, depending on which technology I'm using. I'd better go check that out in the version store if I want to see what the information was on that row. So this allows me to get correct information by using these versions that are created upon modification and this timestamp information that's created upon modification as well.